this is Jonathan David Katz, and I'm standing in the exhibition that I co-curated with David Ward, Hide, Seek, Difference, and Desire in American Portraiture. This is an exhibition that attempts to cross the gulf between knowledge and acknowledgement. Every picture in this room, indeed, in the entire exhibition, has been in a museum before, has been publicly exhibited. There is nothing new on the wall. What is new is the way we're talking about it. Because each of these works talks about aspects of sexual difference. And that is new. That has never been addressed in order to understand the representation of sexuality in the past. In the George Bellows behind me, we see an example of the social codes of this distant moment. There are two men in a scene of a bathhouse. It's called Shower Bath. And in that front and center is a homoerotic encounter. One man, a lascivious caricature, looking back over his shoulder and thrusting his buttocks to a, a heavyset man, much more sort of traditionally masculine, who betrays his excitement with a towel-covered erection. The two men, front and center, in a homoerotic encounter is, are strange even to our eyes today. How could that have happened in 1917? Well, it happened precisely because in 1917, the social codes governing homosexuality were very different. Today, we understand the homosexual as someone who's interested in someone of the same sex. But in 1917, the, the operative category was instead um, not the gender of your sexual partner, but your own gender in the act of intimacy. Other images, if, most notably in the large bellows behind me, where we see a scene of a riverfront frolic. This is, of course, New York. These are working class kids. And Bellows, who was known as an, as an Ashcan school social realist, Ashcan school precisely because he believed in showing us the most, according to the traditions of the time, the most discarded elements of society, immigrants, Jews, and queers. And in this image, we see a lot of mothers bringing and dropping off boys. We see boys skinny dipping in the river, a sea, in fact, of naked male flesh, often youthful flesh. And everybody is belong, belongs there. Everybody's position there is motivated, save one figure. And he's wearing a top hat and gloves and a black suit, and he's a dandy. And he's just there to watch. Bellows, remarkably aware of the dynamics of eroticism in the new urban spaces. She takes the mask that would presumably cover the face of someone in the closet and puts it on their top hat. And not just one mask, but two, bespeaking the twinned identities. But even more compellingly, we must remember that she did this in advance of the metaphor of the closet. So she's inventing the very pictorial vocabulary that would inform representations of same-sex desire for decades to come. But the other artist here, Felix Gonzalez Torres, took a different approach. Softer, more indirect, not less political, but less obviously so. But less obviously so. He wanted his work to be able to circulate like a virus, like a virus. Understood two different political paths. For Felix, it was more important to get the work into the museum and to speak indirectly to the issues at hand. Gonzalez Torres gives us an emblem of the AIDS crisis that works subtly. When we put that candy in our mouth, we participate 
in the diminishment directly and personally of his partner. We also engage in the Catholic ritual of communion. And we also potentially take contagion into ourselves. And an era which cleaved gay from straight and even more powerfully, AIDS from non-AIDS. This is an image that brings us close, brings us into contact, makes us realize that we are the cause of his partner's diminishment. Art is supposed to be provocative and informative, and to take out art that's provocative is squashing dialogue, although it does tend to backfire, as you see, you know, a lot more attention is being paid to the piece um, because of the censorship, but the meaning of the piece is not being discussed. What's being discussed is the censorship, not the meaning of the piece. Was it really offensive to the Catholic Church? Was it intended, rather, as an offensive to the Catholic Church, or was it intended to call attention to the fact that the Catholic Church may preach or, you know, love and assistance, but in the reality they were turning their back on, on people with AIDS and, and uh, the whole no refusal to distribute condoms, anti-safe sex, sex, education. So this, the, 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 the hypocrisy of what, you know, a church says and what a church does, I think, was a real focus of his, of his work, but that dialogue didn't happen. I don't know how to pronounce his last name. David Wojnarowicz. Wojnarowicz. He was um, an AIDS activist. He was a person with AIDS who died. He was an artist. He's one of the most important artists of the 20th century, American artist. The folks outside are here because a national, the Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery exhibition, Hide and Seek, Difference in Desire in American Portraiture, has generated controversy. It's an exhibition, incidentally, that the Smithsonian chose to do that no other museum did or would do. It speaks poignantly to the contributions of gays and lesbians to American art. On the one hand, the Smithsonian has been criticized by some because they feel the exhibition is entirely inappropriate for the Smithsonian and the National Portrait Gallery. It should come down, many have said. A video in the exhibition caused particular outrage by some because it contained images that were seen as religious desecration. In consultation with the museum director and the curator, I decided the video should be removed in the interest of keeping the entire exhibit up. And in my view of my larger responsibility as a secretary of one of a nation's greatest institutions. This has led to others, those who are outside to protest the removal of the video. The fact is, or the bottom line would be, the exhibition with its 104 pieces remains open and does what the Smithsonian's supposed to do, and that speaks to the contributions of Americans to our experience. And our objective is to be as inclusive as we can in that job. Now, clearly, looking back over this experience, there are some things that we wish we had done differently. Well, I wouldn't characterize the decisions that people make regarding exhibits as censorship. Basically, what you're trying to do is to make a rational decision given the position we are in as a great public museum. I would say that we all make choices, and every day anyone who develops an exhibit makes a choice about how best to engage people in the subject matter of the exhibition. You know, and you, you, you don't want to automatically turn people off, so you make decisions about how best to do that. All of us do that every day in our lives. And so I don't, we, we're not out to censor anything. We're not out to censor anything, period. We're out to help people educate, and we want to do that in the most thoughtful way possible. We are dealing with this issue of free speech, rights of free speech, of free speech, rights of free speech, and protection. Protection of individuals, certain individuals, and allowing for free speech, and allowing for free speech, and allowing for free speech.